Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Shift. I'm your host, Palmonia Gordon. And as you can see, we have a guest. And this is not just any guest. This is a young man that I've known for quite some time. And he has a, an amazing background. We actually call him Resilient Mike. And if you know, I mean, when I think of resilient, I think of a dandelion. Man, you pull that sucker and two days later, it's somewhere else growing. I'm like, I swear I weeded my garden. My neighbor, there, there's two of them every week and they pull bags. That's an idea, just a concept of what resilient is. So my guest now here, Michael, Michael Ballard, he's going to introduce himself. I'm going to allow him to speak about the topic I want you to keep in mind. So don't you click that button or go anywhere. We're looking at mental health and the impact this pandemic has had on us. So Michael, welcome to Shift. We're so glad to have you as our guest. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. And yes, it is due because it's been a long time since we said we were going to do this, but life gets busy. Some of us work in more than one spot. Who knew? <laughs> and so it's, it's, I like to talk about resilience because in my background, I had a concussion and my roommate had a concussion and his behavior was 180 degrees different than mine. Wow. With my concussion, I found out his and my behavior are normal. But for me, it was a kid with a concussion. My eyes hurt, my ears hurt, sounds hurt, everything hurt. I was extra sensitive. Oh, just make the world go away for a few days. Wow. He yelled and screamed and shouted almost nonstop for 12 hours when he came in a couple hours after me. Mm. And as a six-year-old, I was like, how can two people with the same issue be so different? Mm. So no judgment, just wow. So that got me started being an observer of human behavior. Mm. No judgment, just how is that possible that you could have a head injury and still want to be loud? <laughs> <laughs> so that got me started at 17. I had a medical issue. The doctor with good attention said, there's nothing you could do. And in my family, you can visit the world of nothing you can do and helpless and hopeless lives there. Mm. But you have to be careful that you only visit there for a short period of time, like an hour or a week or a, or a, day, a half an hour. And so a new university had opened up south of me, York University. So I drove down to their library and a librarian, which is a professional designation, by the way, you can be library staff and that's great and we're really helpful, but a librarian, somebody with a degree in being managing a library, mm. she was so helpful. I regret, I don't have her name. She changed my life. Mm. Michael, what are you looking for? Chronic illness information and mental health, chronic illness information and coping and managing. And she introduced me to research from a leading university that was life-changing and life-affirming. And so there I learned from the university a major skill because my parents would talk about nothing you can do, be careful, it's okay to visit, but don't live there. But this, they, they actually gave me words and processes. So they taught me this. So you could have an issue to be resilient, you have the issue, but if you're not careful and you feel overwhelmed, the issue can start to own you and consume you. Mm. So they call it disidentification. So I still have the issue. The issue doesn't have me. So I still have to be responsible for my health, my chronic illness. I still have to manage it, diet, exercise, all those things. But the issue doesn't own me. I own the issue. So that was the, the big, the big, big, big lesson at 17. They actually gave me words for it as opposed to just this analogy. You know, mm -hmm. you can visit the land of nothing you can do, but don't live there. Well, that makes sense. It's a great place to get started. So that got me going. I uh, have a, I had a sales career where I, for nine years, I did very well. And one year I was sick for four months and pardon me, somebody said I was lucky. And I was like, no, I didn't come in seventh despite being off work for four months. Luck had nothing to do with it. That was hard work. Mm -hmm. I built and engaged with my clients, these relationships that were high level professionalism with a dash of silliness and a lot of joyfulness. <laughs> like that. So I have a phrase I use when staff were having a bad day when I was coaching them back then. And I'd say as we were leaving, so are we good? You and I, yes. You're going to work on what you can change, yes. You're going to work on accepting what you can't change for now because head office is head office, yes. 
then I'd say something silly like it's a throwaway line. Just remember, it could be worse. We could be related and work together. You'd be stuck with my bad jokes all the time. And they'd smile and go, well, I've, that, okay, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so I take, I like to take what I do seriously. I like to take myself lightly because my information is important. I don't see me on a day-to-day -day basis as being important. Now, if you owned a store and you have a new staffer that's doing okay, but you, you just know that they're under potential, I love nothing better than to have you say, Michael, let them be in charge. You coach them. I'm not getting through to them my, my way. You engage with them your way. And I help some staff go from frontline part-time to within a couple of three years, four years, be store managers. Retail's complex, but it's not brain surgery. It's, um, it's, 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 you know, here's the checklist for the clerk. Here's the checklist for the merchandiser. Here's the checklist for the cleaner. Let's put a list together. Let's walk through it. And I loved helping people go from that front line. It's a job. They sounded like Eeyore. To, Eeyore, yes. Yeah. Oh, nothing I can do. I'm stuck with life. No, I talked to the regional manager. And if you hit your numbers, you'll get a raise. If you exceed your numbers by 10%, they promised me they'd go to bat to get you a, a promotion and a significant raise in the promotion. I was very cheeky in advocating for those that I, I coached and worked with. So <laughs> why, why not? I mean, if you owned a store and I can say, I say, if I can get your clerk to increase sales in that, that area by 10%, can they get a raise? Like a dollar an hour, $2 an hour raise. Depends on the volume of the department, of course. And most managers would be, yeah, but nobody's ever done that. I said, well, um, here's our numbers as of today. I'm going to go share it. If you say yes, watch out. And I put in an extra hour a week with your clerk. Because if you can get them an extra $80 a week, you're changing their life back in the 90s and the 80s. So that's me. I love to help people get their, find their groove and their get up and go through being more resilient. So you know, more about me, a dad of two adult daughters, both in their 30s, although soon, not so soon, they'll be older. That would tell you that dad's getting older, too. But I'm perpetually 37. So <laughs> I know I'm not. But I wish to be physically active as if I'm 37. And okay, that's my goal. And my family doctor, you have a chronological age and a body age. You want a body age younger than your chronological age. Absolutely. Otherwise, who wants to be 67 years old body age wise? Have you seen the average 67 year old out there? They're out of shape. They don't eat very well. They didn't wear enough sunscreen. They're old. No, let's go for a bike ride. You want a rollerblade? You want to go swimming? Oh, so many of my friends, they're too old for that anymore. I'm like, are you kidding me? So Actually, I recently had a client say to me, we all get, we all age or get older or get, you know, we all age, but we don't have to get old. I agree. My mom's dad made it to 77 and he was still being 60. He was still living as he was, he was 60 up until his last day. Awesome. And awesome. it's like, yep. I grew up with a, in small town, Ontario, and Mr. Burt lived to be 99 and up to 98 and change. He walked five miles a day, nice. six days a week. Use it or lose it. He wasn't a friend, but he came to the little hardware store I worked in. And he is one of my idols. Said you invest in your, your, your health by eating and exercise and you get dividends the other 23 and a half hours a day or 23 hours a day. Better sleep, better health, better energy. You know, it's like, Oh yeah, and boy, I tell you, he was he was one vigor. He didn't just walk. This was not a stroll. This was a march. Or a walk. Oh yeah, I don't know if I'd want to have kept up back then. <laughs> yeah. They say when you're walking, you're supposed to walk like you're late for the bus. But because many of us don't take the bus, we don't have that pace or momentum. That's actually what I started uh, doing this week. I committed myself to um, getting up, getting dress like I would go to work and I would drive and then I have to park the car and walk to wherever I'm going walk around so I actually get dressed and then walk around the block and then come in to go to work yep. and when work is done I pick up my bag as if I would leave work and then go out walk or you know drive somewhere yesterday I grabbed my book drive somewhere let's sit and you know read 
you know, walk around. I did walk around in the store. I spent too That's much money too. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's we are not even thinking that way. What would it be like if I was going into the office? Can I still maintain some level instead of just rolling out of bed and rolling in front of the the Zoom or the computer or whatever it is we're doing? Can I still get up and do a, a activity that would represent as if I'm going to work? I'll get up, I'll pack my lunch. You know, it's a different pace when you're going. You're, you know, yes, the stress of traffic is removed, but you're still going to walk into the office. You're still going to walk between break. You're still going to walk to the bathroom. You know what I mean? Yep. So, yeah. So, yeah, times have changed. A lot of it all of it has impacted our health. And it's, uh, I was reminded this morning that in 2020, exactly one week before we declared the pandemic, I gave a, a presentation to a group of ladies at an event and my word was touch. Not knowing that a week later, that's the one thing we couldn't do to anyone yeah. was touch. And that touch is more than the physical. There's an intangible touch right now that's been eradicated in a, I mean, it's a, a rapid degeneration, if you will. And I know you're an expert on that. I see you have that, that what's that wheel behind you? I like colors. You see me, I got my red. I see you have the yellow, the green, the blue. Well, what's that wheel? When we went into the pandemic, people started finding out they weren't so much, they weren't so friendly with themselves as they thought they were. In isolation, they mm -hmm. found out that they'd been hiding behind busyness. Mm. It's not a character flaw. It's not a moral weakness. It's not a lack of faith. But one of the things that many cultures don't do is they don't teach us on how to be friends with ourselves mm -hmm. and respect ourselves. So my friend that volunteered for 30 hours a week on top of a 40 hour a week job. That's great. You have that cause and that's wonderful, but that can lead to physical burnout with the repetitive things you're doing in that physical volunteer job. Yes. So why do you have that drive? And there's nothing wrong with God bless you for volunteering for 30 hours a week. Normally that would be three to four other volunteers doing the work of one person. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I tease that books are my drug of choice. Well, I like to read one serious one once a month and two or three frivolous ones mm. because I've met people with good intentions who tell me how they read a book a week, a book a week, a book a week, a book a day, a book a day, a book a day. That's fine. But in my head with the one person I've met three times over 25 years, you're still the same person. Nothing's changed. So why are you reading if you're not using I'd rather you tell me you read a book a year, you dissected it six ways and sideways, you know it backwards and frontwards, upside down and inside out. And here's the seven skills you now use all the time yeah. and all your family uses. Them. That would impress me to no end, but trying to impress me by quantity of books, no. no. When I read, <clears throat> being of a certain vintage, seven habits of highly effective people, yes. it was like, I stopped reading books for three months. Mm. I kept going back to the seven habits because- I realized I was leaving one out entirely. Mm. I hadn't done it for years. I mean, I can tell you now that for 40 plus years of career, I've had 37 major courses of education I've taken. So one of them was only half a day long. It was a $3,800 course, which in the 90s was big money. Still is big money. But in the 90s was really big money. Yes. But I was invited in to take a course that only VPs traditionally took of major corporations. Because I'd done someone some favors. Mm -hmm. They needed some off the book counseling, coaching. And I don't, not a counselor and I'm not a coach, but I did some on off the books because they said, nobody can know what this person's been through because it wasn't them. It's what their family's gone through. They were on the wrong end of behavior. But anyway, so I did. So the thank you was a $3,800 course. And it was like, it's only three and a half hours long, but this is some of the most powerful emotional intelligent work I've ever seen. And it was a hiring profile course mm -hmm. for senior VPs so they could evaluate a candidate in 20 minutes. Mm. Because for argument's sake, you need to hire two people. You have 500 resumes show up. 
you and your assistant shuffle it down to 43. You and your associate then shuffle them down to 11. And then, hmm, out of the 11, which seven do we pull in to interview? Because we need two. Yes. But I don't have time to interview 11 people. Well, this course was to help you look at four key traits that we all have and how flexible and how good are we at using these traits. And that was mind boggling. And that was, I got it through barter. I didn't realize I could get that level of <laughs> gift. Wow. So, so that showed me about emotional intelligence that way. But I came up with this loud, fast, quiet, slow model as one of the things I saw missing, I'm a cancer survivor twice. My daughter's healthy now, but at seven, she had a brain tumor. And I said to the hospital she was in at the time, what skill-based programming do you have to help her cope? Oh, if she's traumatized from the surgery and the treatments, we'll do therapy. I said, isn't that reactionary instead of taking action? Yes. Because if you treat, teach me how to drive and teach me safety rules, like put on the seatbelt, don't follow too far, too close. There's a better chance should I have an accident that I'll be safer and have less impact because I've, yeah. I've had all this training. Why wouldn't you give her training in advance? They didn't know what I was talking about. I'm in a world-class facility. I'm in a room full of experts with double masters, two PhDs, doctors and mental health. That's when I went, wow, I know things that mental health experts don't know. So that's when I made the choice to get extra serious. Mm. So up until my kids got out, of, got out of high school and university, I only played at this for a couple hours a month because I was busy being a dad and earning a living and paying bills and <laughs> life. They're now past 30. And so then when COVID struck, people said, I need it online too. So I've been working on putting it online. And so this gets you to look at your energy because that's an indicator of your state of being. No judgment. Don't judge yourself, good or bad, right or wrong. It's not about lack of faith or willpower, but our energy tells us about how we're accepting what's going on. How we're reacting, are we reacting or responding to what's going on and reacting and responding? If, if you and I are in a public place and a car backfires, there's a good chance I'll go, huh, car backfired. But I've had some major events in my life. And so a couple of experts have suggested that Michael might have some chronic PTSD issues. And so I was robbed by a motorcycle gang. I definitely had some stress and anxiety issues for two days and uh, tried vodka therapy. It's a lousy therapy. So I might jump, I might startle, I might break out in perspiration from that car backfire. But I know this for sure that if I know for sure there's real bullets flying and you're close and you don't understand that you should duck down, you, I'm grabbing you by the ears. I hope I don't hit your head on the floor, but you're going down with me. So my energy i've i've developed a model and i've had good praise from some major groups about it and feedback is to get people to be aware of what's your energy so maybe you're feeling really loud and fast and maybe that's because i'm finally getting to talk to you again it's been a long time except for those little text notes oh are you <laughs> yeah but that's okay you know you're busy i'm busy so it could be just the excitement of respectful oh yeah that palomina she gets things done and she tells the truth. My kind of human being, she's a go-getter to use some old words. So it could be positive. It could be, oh, I think I, I, I forgot that I owe Palomina $1,100 and I never paid her back and she's still kind to me. She must hate me. Oh, so I'm maybe that's- for that e-transfer. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the pits, see, maybe the pits warm up. That's the last interview where there was 143 people on an unexpected meeting call and they made me the center of attention, which was great. But, oh, yeah, it got to me. It was exciting. But English was the third language of most people wow. on the call. And yet they wanted me really humbling. So I'm big things we believe will come out of that. Yes. That's so exciting. being open to opportunities. So the loud and the fast are two, I wanted three year olds to understand Basically, it's their feelings, but I don't want to use the word feelings because unfortunately, some individuals, some cultures, some races, feelings is a bad word. Mm. Feelings are what sissies have. Feelings are what people who have mental health issues have. No. So I, I use loud, fast, quiet, slow to help define 
the state of being we all have, but yes. trying to lower the judgment words or eliminate judgment words. So loud and fast can be both positives or negatives. Quiet and slow. It could be because I went out and maybe I'm five. I played today with my friends in the in the play playground. I had a great day. Had a good day at school. Mommy or daddy or mommy and daddy over supper. We had a good chat and it's time for bed and I'm zonked and that's all good. Quiet and slow. Or maybe quiet and slow is, and I got to volunteer with uh, refugees. Maybe I escaped a war zone. Maybe I had to live in a culvert that was only 12 inches in diameter, sardine in because troops were looking for me to kill me because I escaped the massacre in my village. So maybe I'm shut down because I'm a woman and you're a man and I'm supposed to be safe. I'm in Canada now, but you're the right age to be one of those idiots going around killing people. And I experienced that when I was helping refugees. So I saw people who were scared of me just by virtue I was a white male. Pretty sad, but that's the reality. So I didn't take it personally. It did hurt, but they were quiet and slow to try to minimize how much contact I'd have with them. They are trying to be invisible. So loud, fast, quiet, slow, four states of energy we all experience. Are they building you up or are they wearing you down? And important to know, without judgment though, key is without judgment. So then we developed and we researched some skills that are scientifically validated to help people shift. Because if I've had a really exciting day, and I think back to my sales days where there was five, six, seven figures involved with some of those deals, it's nice to do a $9,000 order back when you're 23 years old. But it's even nicer to do a $159,000 order. And a little older, it was even better to do a million one. Absolutely. <laughs> or, oh, Michael, you were 60% of the effort. We just captured $4.9 million at wholesale. So we just gained 4.9 million and our competitor just lost 4.9 million. You helped create virtually a $10 million differential in our sales figures. That will change the, our cost and effectiveness. We just got more cost effective. Our presses, it was printed product. Our presses will run a little longer. Their presses will run a little less. You just increase the cost a little too. It's business. It's not personal. <laughs> so I, off those positive days, I'd come home and I was like, wow. Well, again, red wine therapy in moderation is a good deal, but in too much, I saw some of my coworkers who couldn't stop. So that made me interested in what can I do physically, socially, emotionally, intellectually to calm my mind again. And my martial arts training taught me some skills. The research from the universities taught me some skills. So we, we included some skills in the course to help you shift from loud and fast to quiet and slow or from quiet and slow to loud and fast, or as people would say, I guess you could be slow and loud. Oh yeah. Absolutely. You could be quiet and fast. Oh yeah. So all the combinations, because if you are more in charge of your state of being, mm. it means you're going to be healthier, more productive, better health management. My chronic illness used to make me feel loud and slow inside. Like I wanted, I was angry. My body was betraying me. Now, with a lot of therapy in hindsight, oh, I lived in a time where if you didn't spell, you didn't pass. Mm. It's really annoying to get a 49 at the end of the year twice. You get 80s and 90s in the hand-ins because you could use dictionaries at home doing the projects. So I knew my stuff. But I can't spell endoplasmic reticulum to save my life then or now. Now I don't care. <laughs> That's right. So I was angry at the system. And I didn't ever get my grade 13. It means I went to college instead of university. Still had a good life, but still frustrating because I think I'd have made a great therapist, but such is life. Anyways, so loud, fast, quiet, and slow. And so if people recognize the state of being and have some of the energy skills, it could really make a difference. And we work with three to 12-year-olds with that model. But mm. then working with youth and regular adult, aged adults, and I call you an adult, somewhere between depending on the individual and their culture, somewhere between 16 and 25 would become an adult. They yeah. say the human brain doesn't become fully grown until it's 25. So mentally, maybe we're not an adult till 25, but I've met 16 year olds that are so responsible. They put a lot of 40 year olds to shame. Absolutely. And so then there's adults. And then I got to work with seniors. And at one point I got a call from a special nursing home who had senior seniors there that all existed in world war II. 
And some of them had been in concentration camps. And it was like, what can I teach people who live through a concentration camp experience where their friends and family were going over there to be gassed and killed? Like, and so the VP of nursing put it very succinctly. They said, Michael, your model helps people understand as they age that physically their body can start to not be peak top tip condition anymore, but they still have social, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual on their side. Absolutely. And so then the other VP of, uh, of nursing said to me, Michael, you also made us laugh about aging. And if you can make two 50 year old nurses who've changed more adult diapers than they care to talk about laugh about aging. And I said, yeah, I guess I did. Cause I shared that at 27, I had a lot of surge corrective surgery. It was 12, it was six hours long. The first one. And after that, for several weeks, things dripped and leaked. I went, what? I phoned my mother, mom, is there a warranty on this body? She said, no, it was only for 12 months. You're way out of warranty. <laughs> so that's my family sense of humor, you know? Yeah. And then after my, my final surgery, because I had five, things leaked, dripped, and made funny sounds for a long time. And I said, so not only do I feel like I know what it's like to be, be, to be 97, but it's now embarrassing. I'm in the middle of a sales meeting and my body would let out these rip, roaring noises. Oh my gosh. Okay. Not socially acceptable. So I just learned to say to my clients, so you know I've had cancer surgery. And it seems that one of the effects of surgery is that my body is going to make socially unacceptable noises. So mm. I will try not to laugh because laughing beats crying because I decided I was not going to cry about these noises. It looks like I beat cancer. So I take it that my body is celebrating by making loud, socially unacceptable noises. <laughs> cool. I like that. And so most of my clients said, well, we'll celebrate with you. So I'm in the middle of a sales meeting and back then it would be like, so let's talk about this $80,000 order for the next, it was social media, social expression. I mean, so your, your Easter order of $89,000. So we've dotted the I's, you the T's, the purchase order is there to be signed by you and by me. And my body would just, I had no choice. I had no control, loud noises. And I remember the one lady saying, celebrate your life. Come on. <laughs> my girl. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, from here up, I'm a little mortified. From here down, it's like, dang, things are still working. This is a good deal. So I get goosebumps now thinking about how lucky I am because the first time in, cancer was in four locations. It spread from bowel cancer to lymph nodes surrounding my major organs. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I Later, I found out 1% for five years and just no chance of 10 or 20 or 40 years. And here I am. It happened at 27 to 33, and here I am at 67, and I'm like, wow. Wow. So wow. come February 9th, coming up, that's the 40-year mark from the beginning of the journey, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I just might get a T-shirt made. <laughs> yes, you should. Yes. So I, 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 I didn't, um, let's see, let's, uh, what, what would it say? Something about the, those noises. That's my body's <laughs> way of celebrating. <laughs> and so, you know, what a great way. One of the things about being resilient is framing. How do you choose to look at it? I could have framed it as that it's disgusting, it's annoying, and it's vulgar. And in some parts of society, that's still considered. When you pass wind or your body grumbles loudly, that's considered vulgar. And okay, not judging it, that's you. But then you're trying to ask me to make my body perfect. That means I wouldn't have been able to leave home for three months to six months and at the three-month mark, I would have had to eat very particular foods. And it took six months to be able to get back to eating regular. And some foods were in tiny amounts for a while until my digestive tract not only healed, but the swelling went down and the healing was complete. Yes. So, you know, I've gone from I could die to you're in the top 1% for healing. Like, it's amazing. Now, I was blessed to have a good healing team. And my surgeons all had a good sense of humor. And my Toronto doctor, he put up with my jokes. I came back in once because one of the medical procedures didn't work. So I had to have an emergency surgery at midnight. Wow. So I told them, I'm here for the warranty work, doc. This is covered under warranty, right? Yeah. <laughs> they said, 
for a guy that came in that could have died within a few hours because I had a block twisted bowel. If it had burst, there was a you don't always make it after that. Yes. And so I said, well, no, but I I was very scared. But framing and reframing, reframing helps me have a sense of control. So yes, I've gone for bowel reconstructive surgery, but uh, now nah, that's boring. I've had tush reconstructive surgery and ladies, I might be the only man willing to admit he's a bit of a perfect ass. There it is, sold. <laughs> so, it's true, I mean, I'm very fortunate to be here. There was a lot of physical and emotional pain but a lot of prayers offered up. So framing it a different way. So for the first five years, I went for colonoscopies and then endoscopies because by the end of it all, I had no large bowel left. So you can't have a colonoscopy for your colon and large bowel if you don't have a colon left or a large bowel. So I have endoscopies. So I used to tease the doctor that it's not, it's not medically correct, but I went to T-cubed, tush tissue tests. It gave me ownership over the process. Yes, yes. Endoscopies, colonoscopies, that's all for cancer patients and survivors. And oh, now I'm thriving. So I'm going to use my words. They're not disrespectful to anybody else. Yes. And also, the medical people put the gauntlet down when they said, We've heard every bum joke possible. So if you can come up with a new one, you can then get permission to tell other jokes. So well, I had to come up with tush tissue tests because I had to have something new and original. You're gonna you're gonna challenge me that I can't tell bum jokes while I'm having an endoscopy or a colonoscopy because you've heard them all. Fair mm -hmm. enough. So they did chuckle at I'm the only man willing to admit he's had a lot of colorectal surgery. Now he's a perfect ass. <laughs> and my brothers were here. They'd add, but if he wants to show you his scars for a quarter, run. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a story, Michael. Oh my so, gosh. But I, I I love you know loud. Fast, quiet, slow. It's acknowledging our states of being because they're very important. Yes. I was born highly energized. And now that could be, and the experts have told me that I'm pro they've, they've got research to indicate it's true. I was born with the cord around my neck, trying to come out bum first. My <laughs> poor mother had, as she put it, more male attention in a very special private spot in one day than she thought she'd have an entire life because after a girl gets married, it's the doctor once a year and your spouse as discussed and agreed upon. That's it. But you, no, no, no. I had gynecologists, obstetricians. Oh my gosh. She said, you, you just didn't want to come out. You are destined to show that tushy. See that even then, you, you made a statement. Hey, my tushy is going to be the topic. So I teased my mother that, well, I didn't want to get born because I had, didn't have to chew my own food, didn't need a bathroom break. My mom and dad loved music. So our house always had a wide variety of music, everything but German operas and horn and hurting music because they had a little bit of country and Western. They had all sorts of pop music. They had opera that you name it, they played it. So I was really lucky to be you know, born in a house with diverse music and uh, I have great memories of them dancing and I was invited to dance Yes, and dance to just about everything. So over the years I've had, when I taught adult ed graduation potlucks, instead of coming to school tonight at seven till 10 or seven till nine or whatever the hours were at six 30, I'll offer barbecue. So I'll offer the following three things. We'll have vegan, we'll have beef, we'll have chicken. And then, and I remember them, people would look at back when we had CD collections. Who are you? <laughs> I said, my music collection will never give away anything. <laughs> It'll just, no extra hurting music. I don't like hurting music where if you play it back, the dog comes back, the truck comes back, <laughs> and the woman comes back. Well, she probably left you for a good reason, idiot. So I don't like that music. And the German opera with horns and, uh, isn't me, but I got about everything else. So I remember one lady saying, Michael, the only other person with these five CDs in my life have same-sex preference, but you are obviously not that person. I said, uh-uh, <laughs> but that's okay. They're them. That's good. And then, oh, the only person I know that's got this music is a music student. Who are you? I said, I love it all. <laughs> so that's part good. of being resilient for me is exploring taste. 
getting comfortable with different things. I remember somebody saying, you have boys to men? Ick. Isn't that just for girls or women? Oh. I said, have you not listened to their harmonies? Yeah. Have you not listened to the incredible skill those guys had? Now, this was the yeah. 90s, right? I, I said, their talent level is huge. So whether you think it's kind of diluted pop, I don't care. The talent is profound. Some of the lyrics are a little corny for at the time for a 40-year-old guy to listen to. But I'm not listening to the lyrics. I'm listening to the caliber of talent. And come on, if you go over here to the to the show tunes, I got Camelot. I got, I got, I got, and I can sing to Camelot pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. Wow. So, Michael, I mean, oh, my gosh, resilient. I mean, now you have clearly painted that picture. So it, 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 it's, it's pursuing some diversity of, of taste so you don't get caught. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. when I teach people to manage their own energy, one of the things that one of my first students ever told me, he only wanted to learn one breathing skill because that's all you need, right? Well, seven years later, I get a phone call saying, you told me, I didn't listen. I had a panic attack because one of my relatives was very ill. And I'm no good to anybody with a panic attack. Can't drive, had to get admitted to the hospital because I let it go too far, too long. It was starting to build over a few days. So when we learn skills, we have to learn several of them. If we learn sales skills, Sales skills are persuading people, not manipulating people if they're good quality, high quality skills. I was forced to take a couple of courses in the early 80s corporately. And I remember standing up once saying, it's great information, but it's all about manipulation. I won't be using it. This course goes against my core values. I persuade people I don't manipulate ever. I want my clients to know exactly what's going on. So they win, we win. This is trickery. We yes. will lose market share if we use this. Yeah. Anyways. So persuasion. So I said, you got to persuade yourself to use at least three types. So for your, for your viewers and listeners, one of them is belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. It's a core skill. It can slow your feelings down, your thinking down, your body heart rate down. My claim to fame is with only some practice for 28 days, I now can, through practicing over time, get my heart rate under 60 beats a minute. Often, always know. Always would be perfection. Yes. Don't care for perfection in the least. But I would like excellence. So I always say I aim for six out of seven days a week to do really well. And one day a week, I'm having a day. Oh, well. Absolutely. I'll circle back and try again tomorrow and do better. Yeah. So belly breathing. I practice square breathing where you put your finger up and you count to four and you inhale. Then you hold for four and you come down and you exhale for four and then you start again and one of my neighbors who knows how to belly breathe another neighbor was with her when she fell she fainted and the neighbor helped her to the ground so she didn't hit her head but when she came to she was panicking i got to i got to help i got to i got called to come and help and she was her, her diaphragm was going up and down like i don't know 180 beats a second and her feet were trembling and her hands were trembling so i held one hand because human touch is important. Transfer of energy, sharing of energy. Absolutely. And I took the other hand and said, we're now going to practice square breathing. Four up, four across, four up, hold, four out, four in, hold for four. And we went much slower than this. Four. We didn't get finished the second one. And the tremble went right away. And we had paramedics that were just, they were just ready to take over. And the paramedics said, where'd you learn that? I've never learned that one. I said, well, you're not only like belly breathing, breathing, but you're visualizing and that makes it more powerful. And I'm also using the power of touch. And I'm trying to be the calmest person she's ever, ever met right now. I'm not, I'm worried for her health. She's a good neighbor. She's a wonderful friend. This is the neighbor that we all deserve if we're nice. Every age, race, color, creed, she wanted to talk to them to say hello. And if you're under seven, she wanted to make you feel welcomed and extra safe. The psychiatric person, I'm making a diagnosis, which is not fair, but the person with obvious health issues mentally, 90 minutes a month, one chat. And then she said, I can't cope for another 29 days, but at least they know I've seen them, heard them, acknowledged them. Just uh, this, well, 
on a one to 10 scale, she's an 11 for being an awesome first class neighbor. Everything I want Canada to be. And little treats to the kids so that one of the adults said, tell me about her. I'm just concerned. My nine year old thinks she's awesome and wants to visit her in her house. <laughs> said, invite her to your place for tea. You'll get to know her. Absolutely. She had not a malicious bone in her body. So yeah. square breathing. So learning different skills, the framing, the reframing, different points of view, the identification versus over identification, practicing disidentification. All these things help us be more resilient and help us manage our energy. Wow. So, did you hear that shift family? I mean, Mike, this episode is your resource center going forward. It's something you want to be able to come back and, and, and check and apply. Michael talk about energy, which I am, I'm, I'm, I'm big on energy and we have to be careful we have to be careful. Absolutely, Michael. I, I had that thought before we had this, uh, this, this call this morning. I'm like, okay, we need to talk. But the energy, you have to learn. One of the things I get passionate about is teaching people to own your space. When you walk into a room, you should own it. Somebody should know, oh my gosh, Michael is here or Palmonia is here because there is something that is unique to you. We have our own essence and we have to always be able to make sure it's good. If it's one of those, like what Michael does with his, with his TTT, <laughs> it's tush, it's, it's, uh, tush she, she test. right? But he owned it. And that was a big part of what he was able to do. Get the elephant out the room before someone goes, what's wrong with him? This is the issue. So if it happens, you already know. If it doesn't happen, damn, that was a good day. And it's owning the elephant in the room. Own it. So I got to work with before COVID youth at risk in Scarborough. And now they're in the program, not because they've done anything wrong, but because they have no living relatives left. Your, your parent or grandparent came to Canada, your single parent died young in a tragic accident, and suddenly you're 15 with nowhere to live. Yes. So this was a room full of 18 to 25 year olds. And I remember the ministers telling me in charge one day, it's like you own these kids. It's like you've hypnotized them and they all are yours. You do in a half a day that takes me weeks to get to do. I said, well, you're the authority figure. I come in as the tour guide. So first of all, you're here, they're there in their eyes. I work with words to try to equalize and do a little bit of this so that, you know, I'm a, I got a little bit more experience than them. Uh, they got a little more experience than me. So I talk about the elephant in the room because not always, but almost always in the 12 years I did it. I was sometimes the only person of my race in the building. Mm. With one exception, I was always the oldest person in the building by three times over often. So I would say to them at the beginning, so can we talk about some of the elephants in the room here that we don't always talk about that are really important to acknowledge? I'm not your age. You're not my age. But that doesn't make me smarter than you or better than you. It just makes me older than you. So... The one thing at your age that I had nothing but disdain for, including my marketing ma marketing professor at university, was he talked down to us all mm -hmm. the time. We were just a bunch of stupid kids, and aren't you lucky that I'm in the room? And it's like, <clears throat> and on occasion, he was rude sexually. So mm -hmm. I called him out on the sexual thing, and I thought for a minute I might be dead. Because <laughs> <laughs> he went all red, the vein came out. And he was really athletic and I knew he was fast and I wasn't sure he had training in martial arts, but I knew I'd be dead with one punch. But after that, he stopped and he was very polite because I own that room. Absolutely. If you're in the room being treated undignified, like, and don't feel the ability to talk, I got your back. I figure that's life. We keep an eye on each other because different circumstances, different people can take, take, take it up. Anyways, he was very polite after that, but uh, I digress. <laughs> And that's, that's one of the, 
Go ahead. Were you going to say something else? I was going to say, you got to own the elephants in the room. So I talked to these youth about age difference. Mm -hmm. So I said, if you even think I'm hinting that because I'm older, I'm smarter. <clears throat> no. I told them uh, one of my first mentors in corporate said, Michael, this is your first day, your first hour. Welcome to the team. But I know that they're an hour late getting organized to take you out. So let me tell you, there's two people out there that you really need to meet. They're both wonderful human beings. One of them's had a 20 year career with us. One of them is close to 35 years. The 20 year career person, and I'm not gonna tell you who's who, you can tell by age probably, but they've had 20 years, but it's the same year every year like Groundhog Day. Nothing compiled, nothing integrated. They make the same mistake at least once a year, it drives us nuts. Not fireable, but just not, they should be happier than this. They should be more successful than this. The other guy, 35 years, he from his first day has kept notes. He's integrated what he's learned. There's compounded wisdom, integrated wisdom. He is a fountain of knowledge. He's an encyclopedia for the whole friggin' company. He doesn't work in that department over there, but he can give you the fundamentals and know at least a third of what the long time, time people know because it makes his job easier. Shipping and receiving, he doesn't live and work there, but he knows 15 to 20% of what goes on there. And that's why his customers love him because he knows how to use the system to his advantage. Yes. In fact, we've researched him twice to see if he was finding a way to take advantage of us. <laughs> no, nope. he followed all the rules, but he knows all the shortcuts to follow all the rules. So yes. as he said, part of it is how do you take care of? So I talked to these youth and then I said to them, one other even bigger than that is race, color, creed. We all got different looks. Mm. That's really important to acknowledge our heritage, different facial structures. And I would pat my belly and turn sideways and pull it out and some of us have more weight than we need and deserve, but you know, that's because I like to eat a little too much because the home cooking is pretty awesome. But that shouldn't get in the way of us sharing because I'm here to work on this and I want to talk about belief systems that's in here. So I said, if you think for a minute, I say anything that's condescending, I want you to put your hand up and say, Michael Ballard, we're bookmarking this moment and at break time or lunch, we're going to have a talk. <laughs> and in my head, I'm going to go, oh, dang, what did I do? Because I need to learn from you as much as you learn from me. But today it's my turn. Absolutely. Unbelievable. The, 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 the respect I got, I told one young ladies one day, like you, she was in red. And at the end of the day, because I only got them for two days, you look spectacular. Your choice of shade of red, wow, you look spectacular, model gorgeous. I'm old guy, not looking for a date. I'm just trying to pass a fashion comment because I'm not sure you know that that you look fabulous. Life's more than looking fabulous, but fabulous is fun and makes you more employable. Every young lady in the class the next day wore red. And, and that is something uh, I find that we even don't do enough of, complimenting. As a matter of fact, people take offense, like, okay, if you give me a compliment, you're trying to you know, do something Butter me up. inappropriate or, no, I mean, you look great. I mean, you look amazing. And, you know, it's okay to own that. Uh, so, so guys, I, we can't thank Michael enough. We're definitely going to invite him back. Better yet, he and I are going to design a program so you can have unlimited access because, you know, words is one of my superpower as well. It's so important, the choice of words you use, because like I said, if you use that word it's gonna make you feel it's it's the breathing as michael teaches the words itself comes with like blowing into a balloon you know it it, it creates the energy for you and i mean the state of being michael spoke about too many things i mean i took notes y'all y'all know me i'm a book and paper girl because when i write it i'm able to remember it Right. Those are some of the 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 art that is being lost because now everybody texts and it's it's very different. And the researchers are saying that texting it, writing it down by keyboarding helps retention, but writing it actually helps retention even more. Right. Because so there's a, there's there's that touch with the paper. There's a different kinetic kind of energy that makes you retain it. It's like saying it out loud is, is more effective because then you're hearing it yes. than just thinking it. 
Yes. Thinking it's powerful, acting it out and thinking it is powerful, but acting it out, thinking it and saying it, yes. that's another set of skills, but then hearing it is another set. So you it's two extra. Absolutely. Very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Guys, this episode of Shift is loaded. Thank you so much, Michael. We truly appreciate you not just giving us your time, which is your most precious commodity, but you have given us skills and tools, you know, square breathing, belly breathing, uh, paying attention to our energy. How do you think, am I loud, fast, quiet, slow? And just conscious awareness, things that Okay, can I stop and pay attention to this? And Michael, uh, uh, you haven't dropped your your uh, uh, contact. Where can we get in touch with you? Where can we reach out to you, get more information so that we too can uh, heal? Because that is the process. And the, the ability to heal is not about going to the doctor and getting medicine. It's about making the decision that I want to be whole. I want to control how I age or how old I become in that sense. Yes, because my family physician wants to know what do I do? What do I eat? Because my body age is 12 to 18 years less than the physical me. And his body age is six years more than his physical age because he does a lot of sitting. He's a doctor. Yeah. He does a lot of consultations. So, and I said to him, well, part of it is your career. I do a lot of sitting too, but I live in a tower. So it's only three flights down to get the mail and three flights up. Yes. So my martial arts teacher told me that you should think of exercise in terms of 30 to 30 seconds to three minute segments. If you don't like exercising, then 30 seconds to 30 minutes, 30 second, 30 seconds to three minutes, several times a day to 20 minutes. And what have they done? And just in the last couple of years, oh, you don't need 20 minutes all at once. Get your 20 minutes over the course of the day. And I'm thinking, how did he know that in 1970, whatever? But he was the one with the martial arts designations and hard fought for belts of accomplishment. It, it, it just it just it just confirms something I've been saying. Everything that we have done, even what you and I are teaching right now, if we go back to um, uh, as a man think it, um, James Allen or Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive, you know, words, the power of what power positive thinking, positive thinking, right? We'll recognize that what happens is that each century brings out a teacher for the time to bring the wording and the communicating the effectively for the people of that time yeah. again mindful of your time because we've done a whole whole lot we have given you more than enough for now michael please tell our audience or shift audience where we can connect you because shift as it says there is simply helping individuals to find their truth their passion and their purpose and i'm going to add in this season to find their mental health yes so you can find me by looking for resiliency for life so resiliency r-e-s-i-l-i-e-n-c-y resiliency for life and we have a facebook page we have a facebook group you have to join and I ask people to join it because resiliency is an asset approach, skill-based approach to mental health management. It's not a cure for anything, but it can help you have a higher quality experience regardless of where you are on the spectrum of mental health. And the research from Winnipeg says that those with mental health issues who practice resiliency skills have a better quality experience, just like the rest of us. And we have a Resiliency for Life page. And then we have a LinkedIn business page, Resiliency for Life. So you can connect with me in one of those three spots. And I believe that we will soon do some online programming. Absolutely. And if all, all else fails, just look for his name, Michael Ballard, and you'll find him. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm.